from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch is featured on this week's cattle market segment. Among several things, she'll break down the rise in dairy cow slaughter as the economic struggles in the dairy sector continue and how that is impacting domestic beef supplies. Then highlights from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. This time, Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber take a look at managing bull body condition and pre-service vaccinations ahead of spring breeding. And on this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman talks with K-State's Elia Mestrovich C. about special accommodations for youth at summer 4-H camp. All this and more directly ahead on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Thanks for tuning in for another Agriculture Today here on the K-State Radio Network. For this week's input on the cattle market trends now, we turn to the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver. And to remind you, that is a service co-sponsored by K-State and numerous other land-grant universities. Caitlin McCulloch is with us once again to go over several things, including eventually here, a look at dairy herd liquidation, how that's affecting the beef supply, that later. Caitlin, a quick look back at what went on in the cattle markets this past week. It was a lower week, by and large, for the fed cattle trade, was it not? It was. The fed cattle market this week did mostly trade lower. Some of that was based on moderate to lighter demand um, across the national picture. We're looking at 2 to $3 a hundredweight lower from where they were last week um, in most of the areas. Caitlin, it seems that the cattle markets are quite reactive to and even sensitive to what's going on in the hog market these days. The day-to-day news about China and its potential interest in purchasing more U.S. pork has been dominant there, and and uh, the hog market did come back to earth, if you will, a bit last week because of some negative news on that front. So will we see this kind of cattle-hog market relationship for some time, do you think? I think the cattle market will still see quite a bit of volatility as it relates to the hog market. One of the struggles with the hog market today is the uncertainty around exports, what's happening in China, how that will impact numbers here, and essentially how that's going to affect the global protein profile. And as you know, beef is part of that. And so one of the questions is, is how much does beef play a role in filling the potential pork shortage? Do those consumers switch to eating more beef products? And does beef benefit? And so when you see large movements, as we've seen in hogs, basically week in and week out, especially since March, those markets are being moved a little bit by that as well. Since you brought up the export scene, the LMIC's website features a a nice summary of the latest meat export numbers. And the uh, overall meat export pace slowed in the month of February, and that included beef export tonnage. You might share some of that information. So beef muscle cut exports on a carcass weight basis was somewhat disappointing in, in the earlier period of 2019, but it's important to remember that's against the backdrop of a record-breaking 2018. So the February data did show a decline of about 6% compared to the previous year, which followed January, which showed an, another 2% decline But still, we're on the second highest February uh, volume on record um, so far. Now, we talked a little bit already about African swine fever and how that's playing a role. Pork muscle cuts have had a similar story. They, too, have been down in January and February, 2% and 8% respectively. But those were still sitting at uh, the second highest volume for February since 2012. So, yes, we may be feeling like those export numbers aren't as great as as they once were, but we're still at very high volumes from a historical perspective. And as far as destinations of U.S. beef exports, the regular cast of characters, if you will, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, those are the main customers, are they not yet? 
Yeah, we've seen most of our quote unquote normal markets continuing to buy beef and pork at fairly high levels. Um, the one thing I would say that we're watching is maybe some of those more fringe markets. Uh, last year, we saw quite a bit of increase in purchases from markets that that maybe don't buy a ton of volume in, in Asia, um, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, all last year. So a notable increases on a year-over-year basis, and that's what we're kind of keying in on this year is what those countries are going to do this year. All right. Well, bringing it back closer to home, the latest on domestic beef demand. If one checks the boxed beef price trends, they've been doing well. Has that continued as of this past week? The cutout continues to hold together very well. Thursday saw a nice bump again in the rib primal values, which has really been a strong story for 2019. We didn't see a seasonal slump in those over the first quarter. Heading into grilling season, all the beef primal values um, have been exceeding 2018 values in the latest weekly data. Choice box beef cutout is up 10% year over year, so showing very strong buying interest and heading into a very important grilling season for the beef market. And so I'd expect that to maintain that strength through the summer quarter. So that should be a positive for a time, you're saying, that this tide of uh, interest in beef purchases here in the U.S. should continue, and with the grilling season ahead, it's really providing important support for the market at this time. That's correct. One of the things that we've been looking at is maybe the difference in how some of the primal values have behaved relative to their seasonal norms. And to some extent, it's been very positive. Um, The rib value adds quite a bit of value, and to see that maintain strength in times of year when that typically is not as strong um, has helped that 10% increase happen. That'll be what we continue to watch through the summer quarter is, are the primal values behaving as we would expect them to? If they're not, you know, is it more on the positive side versus maybe something that would indicate that beef demand's waning? Well, Caitlin, you've been keeping close tabs, as have many others, on what's going on in the dairy industry relative to the beef cattle sector. And Dairy profits have been waning for some time. It's been a struggle for producers to the point now of some level of liquidations, and the numbers of dairy cow slaughter have escalated, you say? We have been seeing very high volumes of dairy cows heading to slaughter in the first part of 2019. Uh, The March data showed dairy cow slaughter over 300,000 head, which is the largest monthly volume since 1986. The dairy herd industry has, over the last, let's say, four to five years, been in this state of very, very low margins, if not below break-even in some months. That's really regional dependent. Our take is, is that margins have been pressured long enough that Liquidation has become necessary for some herds that are unable to continue sustaining losses. I think early on in this four- to five-year period, we saw larger dairies buy up some of those dairy cows, and so we didn't see them exit the dairy herd. But we're starting to see that change a little bit, whether it's because those larger farms have become saturated and they don't want to grow any faster, or that the liquidation phase has just reached a point where we're seeing a net loss in the dairy herd. It probably is a little bit of both. Now, March milk prices do look better than they have in quite some time, but probably one month is not enough to change that trajectory. We'll need several months of, for sure, above $18 a hundred weight to kind of change that picture. So we're expecting dairy cow slaughter numbers to maintain fairly high volumes throughout at least the first half of 2019, and we'll have to kind of see where milk price heads based on these current adjustments to see when we expect those to change direction. So what does this mean then, Caitlin, for beef supplies? So we're seeing plenty of lean beef on the market because of those lean dairy cows coming to slaughter. That's been weighing on the cull cow price, not just in 2019, but in the last part of 2018. The tricky part here is I think any sort of boost to the cull cow price might actually incentivize additional cows coming through that system. And so any precipitous improvement in the cull cow price might be met with just additional volume. And so I wouldn't expect that cull cow value to climb very high this year. I think there's just too much incentive to send cows to market at this point. The good news is, as I've mentioned, we're heading into Memorial Day and summer grilling season. And so 90% lean prices have been climbing seasonally higher. 
and so that could help maintain that cold cow price, but I wouldn't expect you know a huge rally there unless demand can really pull that price through. So, Caitlin, as you look ahead to the trading week before us, uh, any inclinations on what prices might do at this point? Well, I think the futures market, uh, as we've talked about earlier in the program, is continuing to watch what what the lean hog crowd track is going to do. And that's going to play a role in the futures market, not just in the nearby contract, but in later contracts. The protein situation just globally seems very uncertain at this point. And then from a domestic perspective, I think feedlots have been buying feeder cattle fairly aggressively here in March and February. We saw that in the cattle on feed placement numbers that have come out in the last two months. We've seen winter weather dissipate. And so from a feeder cattle perspective, it looks like demand has been better um, for those feedlots that were making a little bit of money here in early 2019 and interest to place those cattle. We've also seen increased demand from grass feeders buying up those lighter weight animals to put on grass over the summer. And so what that looks like for fed cattle prices moving through, we're expecting the summer quarter to be the lowest values as Current supplies of cattle on feed come through that system. We're still at very high levels for cattle on feed inventory in total, but those prices should pick up heading into the fourth quarter on the Fed side. Appreciate the input on this as always, and Caitlin, we'll talk again soon. Many thanks to you. Thank you. That from the Director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch. She's offered her take on the cattle market trends. Incidentally, be sure to have a look at her center's website. It's loaded up with good information for you producers and others at lmic.info, lmic.info. After this break, Britton Rucker is in with excerpts from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. You're listening to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. We're back with Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Coming to you from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University is another BCI Cattle Chat. Participating in this week's podcast are veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson. Also joining them is cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. Brad tells us here the topics they'll be focusing on this time around. As we go through today, we're going to talk a little bit about grass tetany, talk about getting bulls ready for the breeding season. Spring's an exciting time of year. The grass is green. We're getting ready to turn cows out. We're on the front end of breeding season. And so this is a good time of year leading up to the breeding season to make sure those bulls are in, in really good shape. I start with just you know good nutrition, good body condition. They're going to lose some weight once they're in the breeding season, particularly if they're you know, in large, expansive pastures, they're going to cover a lot of ground. So they're going to lose some weight. So I want them with just a little bit extra condition, not not over fat, because you can run into problems there. I think the other thing to think about there, so be a body condition score, I think is really important. Oftentimes, it's pretty easy to forget about bulls in terms of preventative animal health stuff. So, you know, making sure that they get the appropriate vaccinations and parasite treatment, internal, external, well, all that stuff. I mean, a lot of times they're... Get them ready. They're, they're not in the same pasture with, with the females. They're, they're harder to get through the chute. They're harder to handle. So it is really easy to forget about getting, make sure they've yeah. got their vaccines. Go, uh, he'll be okay. Or yeah. if they're in a separate yeah. bin. Yeah. Right, yeah. you don't get him... But I want to go. I want to go back to your, and I'm going to call it the Goldilocks theory of what you just described. Of you don't want them too fat, but you don't want them too thin. Right. Tell me more about how you get those bulls ready, because a lot of times they may have been separate from the cows at this time of year. We're controlling a lot of their nutrition because we're feeding them either stored forages or stored feeds. Tell me what's your target body condition score you want those bulls in at the start of the breeding season yeah and i'll see if dr weber agrees with me but i'm going to say about a body condition score six or just a little better but not not a lot better and the the goldilocks part the not too much or too little if they're too fat we do see more feet and leg problems just it's just the weight of you know they're they're carrying more weight as they're 
getting out and exercising, and they're not as in good a shape. The other thing is if they put fat in the scrotum, they will cause some infertility, some, some sperm abnormality. So I don't want them over fat, but I do want them in pretty decent shape because you certainly don't want them thin. I agree. Six is a target. What about some of these young bulls that are coming off test? They've been on a bull test of some sort. We bought them at a bull sale in March, took them home. How do I handle those bulls? Should I try to keep them at that level? Should I try to bring them up? Should I let them lose some weight when they get home? Yeah, I think the key thing is if you can, and many of you have already got bulls at home, but transition them to a roughage diet is probably the first thing because they've probably been on some kind of relatively high concentrate diet. So some ruminal adaptation is important. Probably the biggest thing is, you know, get them turned out in in a relatively big pen or a pasture so they get some exercise. You know, they've been standing around uh, all winter doing nothing. Get them kind of physically in shape. So the idea of of training, physical conditioning is is a really good one. And one of the strategies that I've seen people do that's really helpful is just forcing them to walk by moving feed and water as far apart as possible you know again getting them in a good enough sized uh, enclosure where they can actually get out and walk and then cover some territory yeah and switching them to a higher forage low concentrate diet they'll probably take a little bit of weight off i don't want to do it too rapidly though i want them to just gradually drop a little bit of weight so that they're still in good body condition when the breeding season starts. Sometimes we'll see those bulls lose a lot of weight really rapidly, and that can be a a real problem if they do that. So we wanted to do this pre-breeding season conditioning to get them in the right condition. So I'm I'm gonna go back to, and we, we touched on preventative health. So give me a little better picture there of what are the things that I should be thinking about as I get that bull ready to turn out. Well, I'm gonna start with some of the vaccines that we're gonna use. And basically the advice that I always give people is, Whatever vaccines you're giving to the females of the same age, so if we're talking about yearling bulls, use the same vaccines that we're using in our yearling females, with the exception of don't give bulls the the brucellosis or Bangs vaccine. But otherwise, basically treat the bulls of the same age. And so then mature bulls, the vaccine protocol that you have your cows on, follow that also with your bulls. So that's that's a good starting place. Primarily a clostridial update or booster, um, respiratory. Yep, you're doing your IBR, your BVD, and, and, and that just... Same products, same timing that you're doing the the females. Leptovibrio? Yeah, again, depending on the area, but probably so. Depends a little bit on the area and what your what your goals are with your, and that's, your vet. A, that's a great area to yeah to work with your veterinarian and come up with what's my vaccination program, and then external internal parasite control. So we want to make sure that we've got some lice control. There. So uh, making sure we got through winter and treated lice. Yeah, bulls are usually a pretty good attractor for external parasites, flies, and, flies. and that. So a, a good fly control program, including you know make again. Don't forget the bulls as you're working the females. Don't forget the bulls. As we think about coming up on that, it's also a time that that we see a lot of people doing breeding soundness exams or BSEs. Do I need to do that every year? If I had a bull that performed well last year, do I need to do it again this year? Absolutely. There are certainly reasons that a bull that performed well last year will will do. And again, foot and leg problems, testicular problems. Those are are real issues that a fair percentage of bulls... This winter was tough on them. Feet and legs, uh, mud, you know, there's fair bit of foot rot around all of those are reasons frostbite i I want to check as we think about those bulls the other thing that we think about in spring is grass tetany bob tell me what is grass tetany basically grass tetany is a magnesium deficiency in the diet of cows that are consuming usually what we consider lush grass so good you know spring green up grass and those cows will show our signs of nervous system problems so they're down, they can't stand, their their muscles might be twitching, they might be hyper excited and maybe even hyper aggressive. They're more likely to want to wanna attack somebody. All of that has to do with just their nervous system isn't working right because the minerals that, that balance their, their nervous system are out of out of kilter. And so low magnesium is really the problem, but it's a little more complicated than that. So it it often happens and, and we'll see it in some of these cows that calved in the spring and they're milking so their their calcium is going into the milk and that changes the composition of their their minerals but on that green growing grass so we may see individual cases of that do you see it as a kind of an outbreak scenario what does it present you can see it both as an individual case or two or an outbreak kind of depending on what the situation is in that you're exactly right heavier milking cows in peak lactation are putting a lot of minerals into the milk so calcium is one, but also magnesium, but both of those are affecting that cow's nervous system. 
So high milking cows are at most at risk. And then the types of forage that they're on. So particularly our grasses this time of year are pretty low in magnesium just because of soil temperature and plant growth dynamics, as well as really high in potassium. It's the stage of growth of the grass, right? Yeah. So we, if we've got forages that have grown for a while, but in that early growth stage, which is where they're nipping it off as, as we get to it, that's where you're talking about it's really low in magnesium and high in potassium? That's exactly right. So that early growth, and it has to do with soil temperature, it has to do with plant growth cycles, but high potassium, low magnesium mineral content in the grass then goes over to the cow, and that's where she runs into this grass tetanier, hypomagnesium. Yeah, low magnesium. Low magnesium. So if I see that individual cow, what do I do? Well, it's an emergency because they can die really rapidly. In fact, that's probably the most common symptom that we as veterinarians are seeing is a producer will call and say, I've got a dead cow. Dead. Yeah, I mean, because they die really rapidly. We can run IV fluids that have extra magnesium and calcium in them that we can run to the cow. And a lot of times, if we can get that in there early enough, we can turn that case around and get a survival. But it is an emergency. This is one that can't wait till tomorrow. That's right. And and you want to get to them right away. And they can be down, but whether they're down or up, you mentioned it, but I I think it's appropriate to know, be cautious because they can be aggressive because they're not thinking right. Even a perfectly calm cow. Even a cow that's usually, (laughs) even a cow that's usually pretty easy to be around will not act that way when they're low in magnesium. Okay. So what do I do to avoid this problem? So we want to feed magnesium in the mineral mix. So a salt and mineral mix that has high magnesium and and higher than what you need the rest of the year. So there's a few months right this time of year leading up. I like to get that mineral into them before the grass turnout and then through that early grass growing season. And then as you get into the, the grass matures and the lactation timing of the cow goes down, then you can move away from the high mag mineral, high magnesium mineral. And then the other problem though is magnesium oxide, which is the mineral that we supply to cattle doesn't taste very good and so you have to really be aware of lack of consumption so a lot of times we'll put molasses soybean meal something to to really attract the cows to eat that mineral mix because it it doesn't taste very good so the other thing i would jump off that and say is monitor what you're putting out there so intake and and that's something bob you've done yeah so keeping tabs on intake and sometimes it it means maybe putting out a little bait supplement or you know kind of mixing up a little a little batch of feed and and getting it in front of them so you're you're assured of consumption because high mag minerals not very expensive dead cows are so this is the time of year to keep track of mineral consumption for sure the old red trace mineral block from the co-op won't get it done so make sure you've got the right stuff in front of them this time of year so excellent well we've enjoyed having you with us today and as always send us questions comments feedback to bci at ksu.edu thanks for joining us from the beef cattle institute at kansas state university that was brad white bob larson and bob weber be sure to hear the entire podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org when we come back eric will have the agricultural news headlines For Agriculture Today, I'm Britton Rucker. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTN. The Wheat Quality Council's annual hard red winter wheat tour will hit the road tomorrow, scouting fields in Kansas and adjoining states and giving the industry an idea of what kind of wheat crop to expect when the combines roll this summer. This year, scouts may get a break from two years of extreme weather conditions the past two go-rounds in the southern Great Plains. Notes the executive president of the Wheat Quality Council and tour organizer Dave Green, two years ago they were scouting wheat 
feet in snow. Last year it was very dry, and he said he was very pessimistic about that crop. After a rough start in the fall of 18, much of the winter wheat crop appears to be in pretty good shape this spring. Green notes that a lot of the crop didn't get in on time. That triggered a whole set of worries about emergence and freezes, he says. But he adds they're finding that the wheat does really look good. It's late, but it's tillering and setting stands. And quoting Green, I suspect we're going to see pretty good wheat. By the way, we'll have reports from the tour later in the week from K-State wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato. Part of recently announced USDA funding for animal disease traceability and identification involves connecting technologies to allow real-time data availability. Here's an update on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Senior Agriculture Department officials such as Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue have stated regularly about USDA efforts to improve animal disease traceability. USDA will not choose a specific technology. We recognize ultra-frequency and low-frequency tags in different forms because we understand that they both have their utility in different animal populations in different production settings. Yet Sarah Tomlinson of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service says recent funding made available to projects studying ultra-high-frequency back tags is focused not on the technology itself, but connection between other forms of animal ID and radio frequency ID. We also want to tie it together with other types of identification and really use what we can learn from these projects to really help us understand functionality overall of RFID, including the back tag, but how does that work with other electronic tags or in different environments, etc. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. We want to encourage you cattle producers to be part of that important symposium on bovine anaplasmosis management and control. K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine is hosting that once again on Monday, May the 20th at the Hilton Garden Inn here in Manhattan. This is the second such symposium on that disease. It is very much a producer-oriented workshop on the current state of anaplasmosis in the U.S., an emphasis on Kansas beef cattle production. It'll feature presentations by national experts on the economic impact of the disease, the prevalence of anaplas, diagnostic considerations, treatment and prevention, and the veterinary feed directive. Among those on the program, several speakers from Kansas State University, including doctors Hans Kotze, Mike Apley, Katie Reif, Emily Reppert, Greg Hanselcheck, plus two other speakers from out of state, from the University of Missouri, Bill Stitch, and from the University of Tennessee, Brian Whitlock. Great program coming up, $25 for the admission. That'll cover the uh, lunch and refreshments. And do reserve your spot at this second symposium on bovine anaplasmosis. Again, Monday, May the 20th at the Hilton Garden Inn here in Manhattan. For more information, go to the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine website. Look under Alumni and Events or call this number, 785-532-5552. 785-532-5552. Also on the calendar, that series of emergency livestock management workshops scheduled for this spring will get going tomorrow in Great Bend and will continue throughout the month of May. Once again, these are being put on for livestock producers to look at foreign animal diseases as a possible threat and how an outbreak could impact producers as well as the industry as a whole, looking at what precautions can be taken to protect herds. The first of these is set for tomorrow in Great Bend, then and Wednesday, May the 1st in Montezuma, and there are six others taking place throughout the month of May once again from 9 o'clock until 3 o'clock in the afternoon at these locations. If you'd like to learn more, go to the agriculture.ks.gov website under emergency management, agriculture.ks.gov slash emergency management. And do take part in one of these emergency livestock management workshops for producers through the month of May. Now it's on to this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester Bob Atchison. Bob? Millions of dollars are available for Kansas farmers, ranchers, and landowners interested in tree planting and woodland improvement. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program, otherwise known as RCPP, is delivered through EQIP and is focused in high-priority watersheds in the eastern third of Kansas. 
The Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University delivers the program through professional foresters that provide on-site visits to help landowners develop project plans. The goal of the program is to improve the overall health of Kansas watersheds above federal reservoirs that provide two-thirds of the water supply to the people of Kansas. These reservoirs are filling up with sediment from failing stream banks, and planting trees and caring for woodlands can help reduce erosion and, in the long term, the expensive cost to dredge these reservoirs. To qualify for the program, landowners must own property within an eligible watershed and have a resource concern, such as stream bank erosion or woodlands in need of improvement. Program eligibility may be determined by contacting the Kansas Forest Service or local county farm service centers, Natural Resource Conservation Service offices, otherwise known as NRCS. Program information may also be obtained by contacting the Kansas Forest Service at 785-532-3300 or on the web at www.kansasforest.org. Funding is awarded on a first-come, first-served basis, and applications are processed as they are received. Forestry contractors are available to undertake projects from start to finish, and the majority of their costs are covered through the program. The program can improve the overall value of a farming or ranching operation by reducing the loss of valuable farmland through tree planting and increasing the productivity and health of Kansas woodlands. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University, encouraging you to sustain the welfare of Kansas natural resources by participating in this important program. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. This week's 4-H segment is next on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. With the school year winding down, many youth are starting to think about attending summer camp. If a youth requires special accommodations, Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist Alaya Mestrovich C. says that she can help develop a plan for them that allows them to attend camp as well as participate in a wide range of activities. Alaya, kind of hard to believe, but we are rapidly approaching the camping season. And as part of that, you are currently doing a lot of intake processing for people who may have some special needs in terms of accommodations. That's right. We like to make sure that our extension partners know that through uh, Kansas 4-H, we do intakes for uh, youth with disabilities. We uh, work with the local unit, the youth and the family, which is a, a very interactive engaging process to make sure that the youth has the support in place to have accessible programming. In terms of how the processing works, what type of things are you looking for or what type of things are you looking at, I guess? First, what would happen is typically the agent would notify this Kansas 4-H state office that there is a youth in need of disability accommodations. These can be any type of disability accommodations related to the youth's disability. This could involve a physical disability, a visual impairment, a developmental disability, or maybe even a mental health disability. There are so many different types of disabilities out there, so we want to treat each situation with sensitivity and treat it as unique. And this intake allows us to better understand the disability and what accommodations are necessary. You know, any type of disability is something that we can work through and look at accommodations for. So we work with the agent, the youth and family, and the Kansas 4-H state office to determine what that would look like so that we are complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then all of this would be put into place at the camp? Yes. We like to treat each situation as unique, even though, you know, my background is in disability management counseling. So it might be a structural issue. It might be additional support in in some types of programming and not in others. 
but we treat each case as unique to make sure that that youth is fully engaged and that programming is accessible to them. And because this may take a while to work out a game plan, that's one of the reasons you're doing so many intakes now and would like to get as many done as you can over the next month or so before camp season starts. That's right. We just want to get the word out to everybody that, you know, in preparation for camping season, it's really important that we all work together. We do not expect agents to come up with disability accommodations on their own. That's a a huge responsibility. And the optimal situation is when we're all working together, we're working with Research and Extension for a youth development and, and making sure that we have just the right accommodation for the youth. We would never want to turn anybody away. We want to make sure that programming is accessible and that every single youth has a sense of belonging and they feel like a part of the camp group. In terms of meeting these accommodations, can you give us maybe just a couple of examples of how this whole process might play out? Absolutely. For example, if we were to have a youth with autism, there is a wide range of different types of autism spectrum characteristics that can come up. So if we have a youth with autism, we may find a way to have um, an area where they can go just to kind of have a quiet space to kind of ground themselves. We might have a person that they check in with, or, you know, we might make them more aware of uh, the schedule so that they understand the transitions that will be happening from one programming aspect to the next. So there's a lot of support that we can put in place if we know that the youth has autism to really make that experience engaging for them. Another example, a very typical example, would be a youth that is deaf and hard of hearing. In that case, we would be putting in place uh, volunteer sign language interpreters from breakfast to lights out, (laughs) and typically we would rotate them. So there are typically two interpreters that are always rotating throughout the day, or even then some. We typically like to start with volunteer interpreters because 4-H is built on a foundation of volunteerism, but there are also times when we get paid interpreters as well, depending on availability. And so once we know that the youth has a disability, we can put all of the support in place necessary to make sure that they have a really engaging experience. And the sooner that we know that and the more time we have, the better it is for everybody, even though we would never turn anybody away. I'm imagining that there is a learning process through this camp when people who do not have a disability are around people who do have a disability and can see how well they can function. Yes, absolutely. You know, having an integrative model, having youth with disabilities, youth that maybe do not identify as having a disability is a wonderful learning experience. And we really want to model what we want to see happen in the world. That is not to say that disability camps aren't absolutely wonderful as well. You know, actually out at Rock Springs, there is a camp specifically for youth with diabetes that happens every year, which is awesome, right? But here in Kansas 4-H, we have a more integrative model. And so that really allows youth to see all different types of people and see how we can have unity in diversity and really celebrate our unique differences. If there is someone who needs to set up this intake process, how do they go about doing that? Do they start with their local extension office? That would be great. Yes, they could talk to their agent and request disability accommodations. And then the best thing to happen would be for the agent to reach out to me at the Kansas 4-H state office, and we would try to make that intake for disability accommodations happen as soon as possible. An intake typically lasts about an hour where we just better understand the disability type and what accommodations are necessary. And then we do our best to get that taken care of in a timely manner. And do you go to them or do they come to you? We have done all kinds of intakes. I typically really like to go to the youth and family and the agent if possible. And sometimes we've done it over the phone via Zoom and sometimes they have come to us. But if timing is okay and and scheduling works, then I typically will go on site to the local unit and do the intake there. And this probably provides the parent and the youth with a little bit of confidence heading into the summer camp. Yes, I would say there is a lot more confidence. We really like the youth to know that we're there to help them and support them through this process, that we want them to be part of camp. And, you know, there is a part of 4-H online where a parent can put down the youth's medical condition or disability, but having an intake is so much more enriching for the youth and family. It helps set them up for success, 
And I would say that they are much more confident in that regard. And, and we do get so much more information out of an intake process. That's Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist, Elia Mestrovich C. Again, if you need more information about special accommodations for 4-H Camp, contact your local extension office. And to learn more about 4-H programs and activities, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman.